AT&T plans to buy T-Mobile USA in a $39 billion deal that would make it the largest cell phone company in the U.S. Well, it was virtually a dead brand. It had very low brand awareness. We are going to redefine a stupid, broken, arrogant industry. Virtually everybody in the entire world knows that jingle. For many of us, that ringtone is not just reminiscent of a certain company, but an entire time period, the early 2000s. A time before smartphones and smartwatches and smart everything. Computers and cell phones were just starting to gain popularity amongst the general public, and ringtones were a fashion statement, not something that you would apologize for. But as smartphones became more mainstream, the popularity of ringtones fell off a cliff, and with it went the popularity of T-Mobile. This trend was only made worse by the 2008 financial recession, which caused the stock to sell off 86%. Things got so bad that T-Mobile even agreed to being bought out by AT&T for $39 billion in 2011. But that deal was stopped by the US government. With nowhere left to go, T-Mobile just continued its death dive, and during the worst of it, T-Mobile was writing off everything they had, leading to losses of over $7.5 billion per year. At this point, you would think that it was just a matter of time until T-Mobile filed for bankruptcy. But then came a new CEO, John Ledger. Hopes weren't that high given that John did not have much to work with. But somehow, over the next eight years, John would stage out one of the biggest comebacks of corporate history. Since then, T-Mobile has grown a mind-boggling 1900% or 20x. And they have transitioned from being the ones who needed a bailout to being the ones handing out bailouts. Likely the best example of this is their merger or basically acquisition of Sprint, which propelled them to not only be a telecom juggernaut, but be the largest telecom company in the entire world, period. They currently stand at a valuation of $186 billion. And fun fact, the recession hasn't affected their stock price whatsoever. They're literally floating around all-time highs as we speak. So here's how T-Mobile went from being so popular that they were a symbol of a time period to near bankruptcy to becoming the largest telecom company in the world. Taking a look back, the story of T-Mobile doesn't actually start in America. It actually starts in Germany. And to this day, the original T-Mobile or Deutsche Telekom is still a German giant. In fact, they're the sixth largest telecom company in the world and they trace their roots all the way back to 1866 to Germany's National Postal Service, Reichspost. While the organization was technically a mail service, they were really more of a communications business. So after the invention of telephones, Rexpost was one of the first to adopt the technology and spread it across the country. But the real rise of Rexpost did not come till the rise of Mr. Small Mustache in the 1930s and 40s. Mr. Small Mustache was well aware of just how critical robust communication was in trying to challenge the world powers. So he spent a lot of resources to build up Rexpost, and before Germany started losing, Rexpost was stronger than ever. For obvious reasons, the Allied forces weren't exactly fans of this, and after they took over, they would shut down Reichspost in 1947. They would split up the organization into a few smaller organizations, the most notable of which were Deutsche Bundespost in West Germany and Deutsche Post in East Germany. These two organizations would essentially remain as state-owned monopolies up until the fall of the Berlin Wall. Just a couple of months before the collapse, West Germany would split Deutsche Bundespost into three sectors, which included a postal service, a postal bank, and of course, a communication service. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, these sectors would basically absorb the remains of the East German services. And given that capitalism was now the prevailing idea across the country, Germany would eventually decide to spin off these sectors into public companies at the beginning of 1995, leading to the creation of Deutsche Telekom. Around the same time, an American wireless communications company called Western Wireless was starting to gain a lot of traction. 
Western Wireless was founded in 1988, and they were an early mover when it came to wireless technology. I mean, wireless is literally in their name. Given that Western Wireless did not have the infrastructure to compete against AT&T in the traditional telephone market, they spent all of their effort on the wireless market, and more specifically, the rural wireless market, which was regularly overlooked by the large providers. It turns out that this was actually super lucrative, and Western Wireless would eventually grow to compete in even non-rural areas. In the meantime, given that Deutsche Telekom was now a corporate entity focused on profits, they would shift their focus onto aggressive expansion. They expanded to basically every European country you can think of, from Austria and Croatia to Slovakia and the UK. But for the purposes of this video, we'll focus on their expansion to the US. This came in 2000 with the purchase of a subsidiary of Western Wireless called Voicestream Wireless for a ridiculous $50.7 billion. Fortunately, they would negotiate this down to $30 billion, but Voicestream wasn't worth anywhere near $30 billion either. Deutsche Telekom bought the absolute top of the dot-com bubble, and when the crash came around, their stock would fall 90% and never recover. But on the bright side, they now owned what we all know as T-Mobile. While Deutsche Telekom likely overpaid for Voicestream by a full 10x, it wasn't all bad news. At the end of the day, Voicestream was still growing rapidly, and Deutsche Telekom had a bunch of money that they could throw at Voicestream to try to win the US market. In the early 2000s, this worked out great, and this is why we all remember the T-Mobile jingle to this day. But T-Mobile had one major weakness, which is that they weren't actually doing anything particularly noteworthy or innovative. They were basically just riding the wave of wireless adoption. And while this worked out decently while the market was still exponentially growing, the same could not be said about the mature market. You see, once the cool factor of having a cell phone wore off, people actually started to value the quality of the connection. And let's just say the quality of T-Mobile was absolute garbage. While this made customers quite mad and irritated, it wasn't enough to kill T-Mobile altogether. Something that was enough to kill T-Mobile though was AT&T. AT&T had been watching this whole saga from the sidelines. For the entirety of the 1900s, they were the undisputed king of telecom. Even government mandated breakups could not destroy their power. But now, all of a sudden, some rural wireless network owned by some Deutsche company overseas was threatening AT&T's dominance in their home country. This was unacceptable, and AT&T was determined to put T-Mobile back in their place. But to do this, AT&T had to make big bets. Simply offering better service wasn't good enough. So they looked back at their history and analyzed how they got so big in the first place, and the answer was that they were an unbreakable monopoly. What they had to do was recreate this monopoly, and the perfect opportunity to do this came with the iPhone. Apple wasn't exactly an easy company to work with, but AT&T was willing to do whatever it took. This included giving Apple full control of the software, paying out Apple for every iPhone that was sold, and probably dozens of other clauses as well. But in return, Apple granted AT&T with exclusive rights to the iPhone, meaning that if you wanted to buy an iPhone in the US, you had to buy it with an AT&T connection. This didn't seem like a big deal given that no one really knew how big the iPhone would get. But looking back, this was likely AT&T's best choice of the century, as they were able to rebuild their monopoly for nearly four years. It wasn't until 2011 that Verizon would get their hands on the iPhone, and Sprint would also partner with Apple later that year. Back in Germany, Deutsche Telekom had struck a similar exclusivity deal with Apple like AT&T. But as for T-Mobile US, well, they were screwed. They would essentially seek out a bailout from AT&T. But as we touched on at the beginning, the government would block that from happening. It seemed like T-Mobile was gonna share the same fate as most of its dot-com peers. In a last-ditch effort, the company would hire a new CEO named John Ledger. And man, this guy would do the impossible. John wasn't your typical CEO. In fact, he was the exact opposite, and he wasn't afraid to admit that either. The first thing he noticed after he took over was the overly diplomatic nature of the telecom industry. 
Everything was so uptight, pristine, and closely monitored. This was the way that AT&T and Verizon liked it, and so everyone followed suit. But this strategy clearly wasn't working for T-Mobile. Not to mention, T-Mobile had none of the pristine advantages that AT&T or Verizon had. They didn't have a deal with Apple, they didn't have a massive marketing budget, and they didn't even have a strong network. In fact, they had a notably crappy network. But despite this, T-Mobile was trying to act like an equal peer to AT&T and Verizon. So John decided to take the opposite approach. Instead of trying to hide who they were, John embraced it. He realized that people were fed up with AT&T's predatory cell phone contracts with loads of fine print and dozens of hidden fees. So he made T-Mobile the uncarrier, and the first step in doing this was calling up Apple. John didn't ask Apple to give them a juicy deal. In fact, he asked for the opposite. He asked if they could sell the iPhone for MSRP. Given that this didn't seem threatening to AT&T or Verizon, Apple had an easy time agreeing with this. And with that, T-Mobile finally got the iPhone in 2013, and they embraced who they were. Yeah, they were crappy, they were cheap, and yes, having a T-Mobile connection would probably hurt your social status. But guess what? They're not gonna overcharge you or screw you over with the fine print. There was also absolutely no contracts or cancellation fees. And for tens of millions of Americans who had been screwed over by AT&T and Verizon for decades, this is exactly what they wanted. But this did not mean that people switched over instantly. In fact, it was a rather slow burn because people didn't quite trust T-Mobile. I mean, there's no way that a carrier was actually acting decent and reasonable, right? That breaks the laws of physics. So where's the catch? Well, there actually was no catch, but the general public only started to believe this once their daring friends and family confirmed that there was no catch. This strategy did destroy all of T-Mobile's margins as they lost out on all of the predatory revenue. AT&T, for example, generally has net margins of 10%. Meanwhile, T-Mobile was barely able to crack net margins of 2-4%. to But something that T-Mobile had that no one else did was happy customers, and this translated to exponential growth. In the last 10 years, T-Mobile's annual revenue has rocketed from $5 billion per year to $80 billion per year. And today, T-Mobile has a total of 110 million wireless subscribers, which is about a third of the US population, making them the world's largest telecom company. While T-Mobile has maintained their generous customer policies, they haven't been as stubborn when it comes to maintaining their crappy quality. Instead, they've invested much of their extra revenue back into growing their infrastructure and making the service better. And today, they're actually the leader when it comes to 5G service. According to some research done by OpenSignal, the average 5G download speed for T-Mobile was 150 Mbps. This was three times higher than AT&T and Verizon, who scored about 50 Mbps. And speaking from personal experience, 150 Mbps is actually the low side when it comes to T-Mobile's 5G speeds. If you live in popular suburbs or urban areas, you can expect much faster speeds. For example, I live in Austin, Texas, and I regularly get download speeds above 600 Mbps. I mean, that's literally fiber speeds right there. So clearly, T-Mobile is no longer just killing it in the affordability sector. They're also killing it in the performance sector as well. And that's how T-Mobile went from being a legacy German company who tried to win using their power and influence to being the underdog favorite to being the global champion. It looks like doing the right thing it does end up paying off from time to time. Do you like your carrier? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you wish that all carriers were as decent as T-Mobile. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.